obviously got the touch. Over to you, Mark. <laughs> All right. Can you kind of see me? Look, I'm wearing my red hat shirt. Oops pointing to the wrong side because of the camera. Uh, good to see, well, not see you all, but good to know that you're all out there somewhere and see your names in the chat window. Let me just see if I can actually share a screen. Okay, now Amanda and Steven, I'm gonna be passing to you. Can My screen is shared and you can yep. see and hear me. I take all it. working. All right, awesome. Um, yes, hello everybody. Nice to be here. Um, as Steven said, I'm a developer advocate with Red Hat. I'll try and make sure I repeat that a couple times. There's a Red Hat logo in the corner of all the slides. So I'm sorry, you'll hear a little bit about Red Hat, but yes, I tend to not talk about it as much as I should as an advocate, but I'm very pleased to be back here and to be able to contribute to this conversation that I believe uh, Vikas Kumar uh, started about a month ago or so. Uh, and I'd like to go just a little bit deeper into that discussion today. Um, and come at it from an angle that was inspired by a question that I believe, you know, maybe one of you people were the, the, the person who asked this question, but they asked about like how Tecton compares to Jenkins. So though this is a sequel of sorts uh, based on that question, if you haven't seen Vikas's talk, that's okay. It's not a prerequisite. Uh, today, I hope in the next half hour or so, given how much time we have, uh, I hope to introduce or reintroduce you to this thing called Tecton. Uh, describe the need that it's trying to fill, why people decided to build this kind of open source CI CD chain, as well as three big reasons why you should care about Tecton. Uh, I'll try and show you a demo, uh, it'll probably be pre canned just for the sake of things always go wrong, and also time lapse is important. I'll explain why in a second, but I'll show you some stuff with uh, building, uh, building a real app or a real pet clinic app in Tecton. Uh, and then finally, I'll give you some context to answer the question of whether you want to try things out with Tecton or not. Uh, if I've done my job right, you'll understand what the heck this title screen has to do with anything. So stay tuned for that. Now, a starter story is something we can all relate to. I mentioned before that we have this thing here, a website, and not just any website, the Pet Clinic website, which is a bit of a hello world kind of website for uh, Java developers out there, particularly uh, Spring developers. Now, continuous integration is not a new concept, I know, and but for real websites like this one that Pet Clinic represents, um, it's kind of become more important than ever uh, in helping companies adopt sound DevOps practices, that they have a sound CI CD tool chain. Um, and you know, trying to all the kind of cool, what all the cool kids are talking about, shifting left, finding problems early in integration instead of when things are in production. These are all the bread and butter of uh, CI and CD tools. And there are myriad out there. And there may even be a poll that floats across your desk before we're done that asks you guys what tools you may be using out there. Um, but to as we get into this, let me introduce you to Michael, which was a popular name in the 80s, and Michael is steeped in the 80s, as you see here. Now, let's pretend that Michael is a DevOps engineer, and he's no slouch when it comes to the importance of continuous integration. He's a big fan of Jenkins from, from way back. Now, Jenkins is an open source CI CD darling. It's one of these tools I've talked about, and it's not new that we need continuous integration. It's For those of you who are not 100% familiar with it, it's set up in a master agent kind of configuration where builds are defined on the master. The master triggers the appropriate agent as requests to build or integrate to kind of come in. Uh, now, it's been around for ages uh, for, you know, for good reason. It's open source. Um, so it's free to use, and like all open source, it benefits from the innovation of the world at large. And being at Red Hat, like we're big believers in the innovation that comes from open software. So big, big tick for Jenkins on that front. Um, it's trusted by the masses because most of you, if you're involved in ops at all, you've probably touched Jenkins in one way or another. Um, and it's tried and true. It's been used in production and in you know all over the world. And finally. You can build just about anything with it. Uh, it comes with an extensive plugin library, uh, which is both good and bad. We'll explain in a second. Um, and Jenkins can be used to automate even the most idiosyncratic project integrations. And I asked a friend of mine who's uh, in DevOps, what he, what's the craziest thing he's ever built with Jenkins? And my favorite answer to that, he said, was Jenkins building Jenkins agents, which was awesome, sort of an inception kind of thing going on with Jenkins. So it can build anything, even itself sort of like a like a Turing machine, better than a Turing machine. Um, 
In fact, it so happens that when we're talking about Michael and his love of Jenkins, here's the pictured pipeline, the Jenkins pipeline, right? And he's got all the usual steps in his CI CD chain and his imaginary kind of DevOps pet clinic world. He checks it out, he sets a build version so he can tell builds apart from one another, he builds it. And then he does some fancy things, he analyzes it, you know, he does static analysis while doing unit testing, he does these things in parallel. And at the end, he's prompted whether he wants to move things to the staging environment, particularly, you know, presumably depending on how the different tests and stack analysis and everything like that went. Now, you may have noticed that uh, Michael's pipeline had a build image stage in it. And to those of you who are uh, perceptive, it looks like his website might be running on something like a Kubernetes since it has an image. And this is where Jessica comes into our story. Now, before you go any further, just quickly, Steve and Amanda, can everybody, or can you two at least hear me okay? Just make sure I don't go too deep into the material. Oh, really? All right, cool. Oh, really? Cool. So Jessica, for the purposes of our contrived little story, uh, she's all about the continuous de delivery, the sort of CD part of the CI CD tool chain. The goal of continuous deployment, as you know, is to kind of have code in a state where you can readily deploy it to production without too much effort. A perfect CD kind of setup is something where at the push of a button, it automates kind of a release into production. And usually that comes with other aspects of modern continuous deployment, like zero time roll, zero downtime rollouts or AB testing, blue green environments. These are all trappings of, of continuous delivery. And Jessica is finding Kubernetes just finger licking good for something like this. And why does she love Kubernetes? Well, it turns out, I don't have to tell you all that Kubernetes is cool, but let me highlight some of Jessica's favorite aspects of Kubernetes, which just so happen to be very relevant to what we're discussing today. One is that it's made up of containers, the immutable little darlings that are sort of the atomic elements of uh, deployments on Kubernetes. And you know they're highly resilient in a continuous delivery scenario. Kubernetes, I wanna highlight the infrastructure as code. It's clear in its declarative nature, how you make something like Kubernetes, uh, how you adapt it to something like GitOps, which is also very trendy nowadays. And when paired with technologies like Knative, uh, we have the ability to make the most of the resources on the cluster uh, by only spinning up pods when we need them. Uh, that's, that's a topic of another talk about serverless. Now, Jenkins is great, um, but the fact that Jenkins is building images for Kubernetes implies that either Jenkins, the Jenkins instance itself is running on Kubernetes, or it's running outside the cluster and pushing images into it. Either way, there are a few things that makes, makes the world less than ideal for Michael and his use of Jenkins. Now, classic Jenkins, and I know there are variants, and we'll get to that before we're done, but Jenkins was kind of des designed for a different era and an era that I'm obviously old enough to understand back when you had name servers or at least name VMs and you were using things like Jenkins that was passing off to Octopus Deploy to deploy .NET code back in the day. Um, containers back then when Jenkins first emerged, they were just a novelty. And if we for a moment relegate Kubernetes to the sort of continuous delivery, continuous deployment part of the CI CD pipeline, um, we wind up with problems like this when it comes to continuous integration. One is that Jenkins is monolithic because that master, uh, it needs, it's, the cent it's a central kind of point of failure, which we'll get to in a second, but it's kind of monolithic. So it's a big runs a Java, uh, Java VM. It's difficult to isolate. This is something that people don't always notice unless you've had to run a number of projects through a single Jenkins instance that uh, different projects sometimes use different versions of plugins. So it can be, projects kind of leak their dependencies through the central master. Um, Jenkins isn't highly available out of the box. There's usually one master. If you want to kill your CI CD chain, you know where to go and a surgical strike to the master node. Um, you could set it up to be more highly available, but then it gets to the original part where you always have a master kind of running. Um, for those of you who are managing Kubernetes platforms, Jenkins kind of becomes a little bit of a platform in a platform. Um, and while Jenkins, I'm not saying it can't be coded, you know, infrastructure as code, you do wind up having to jump through a couple hoops in terms of you're gonna have a Jenkins file, you're gonna have a Groovy script. If you have plugins like for Kubernetes, the Kubernetes plugin, well, that for some reason that uses XML to kind of define agents. So you're gonna wind up having a couple difficulties, uh, at least standardizing your infrastructure as code. 
and also the security concerns that come with some of these plugins and the vulnerabilities, the master being a, sort of a honeypot or a center of concern. Now, can there be a better way? And this is where I'm gonna show you guys, hopefully, let's see if we have it here. Let me show you guys a little movie that will hopefully tie this all together. So let's see if this works. Yum. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Yeah, isn't that? It's dinner time. It was great. That is, <laughs> yes, and this is great fun. Um, just see here, this is actually on YouTube. This is a, from a, a commercial from the 1980s. Those of you who lived in the US may have actually remembered that commercial. Um, the link is there, the slides will be pre presented afterwards, but some of the comments were just awesome. And particularly in these COVID times, I love the one about who the hell walks around eating a bucket of peanut butter. It just, it seems so very wrong in this day and age. But anyway, this is my, this is the point. So if using that cheesy trope from these 1980s Reese's Pieces peanut, or Reese's peanut butter cup commercials didn't already make it clear where I'm going, uh, let me attempt to sum it up with an equation, which you see right here. You start with the creamy peanut butter customizability of Jenkins, and you add to that the event-driven scale to zero functionality of Kubernetes with a little help from Knative, and you get Tecton. It's Kubernetes native CI CD tool that's greater than the sum of its parts. So basically, Tecton, you got Kubernetes in my Jenkins. And that's some Tecton up, that's what it's all about. It's all about trying to make a CICD pipeline that reuses as much of Kubernetes and as friend, is as friendly as Kubernetes as possible. So by that, I mean, one, it's you'll see it branded as Kubernetes native. This means it is out of the box, highly available and elastic because it uses Kubernetes to give it those powers. Uh, remember how Kubernetes is so good at continuous deployment? Well. That's what Tecton is leveraging here. Um, it also, configuration is standardized in terms of everything is YAML first. So that's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you stand on YAML, but it certainly lends itself to trendy things like GitOps. Um, you also, your build chain and your apps, they run in the same cluster. That can be a big win uh, for some of you that don't want to run your tool chains outside the cluster. And again, since it is unified, Tecton is actually implemented as custom resources in the Kubernetes cluster. So any upgrade to Tecton, though it can be upgraded separately through things like operators, but in general, updating a cluster kind of updates Tecton. And you can reuse, Tecton uses containers at its core. We'll talk about this a bit. So some of the security scanning processes you may already have in Kubernetes land, you can use for Tecton. So you can start to see from the surface that the two look kind of similar. On the left, you see kind of the Jenkins Blue Ocean version of a pipeline. And then you see on the right, the beginning of that pipeline uh, being kind of translated into Tecton by way of something called OpenShift Pipelines. This demo, again, full disclosure, I work at Red Hat. This demo is, was done on top of OpenShift, uh, which was most convenient for me. Most of what I'll be showing you though isn't specific to OpenShift, a lot of these things can be done on Kubernetes. I'll try and flag when we hit something that's OpenShift specific. So in describing the features, um, we look for this little ribbon when, as I go through a little bit about how Tecton works and then show you a bit of a demo, uh, look for the little Tecton ribbon, the seal of approval. So these are where those top three features, the killer features of Tecton that would make you even get out of bed to consider a new Kubernetes tool chain or a new tool chain just in general. So again, just to orient ourselves, it runs on Kubernetes, it's a bit higher up, you know, probably it could make use of things lower than it, but it's meant to be there in the application stack. We're gonna have a ton of time, just move on to the next one. So this, I'm gonna tell you about some of the primitives and Vike has kind of talked on, uh, touched on this a bit, but this is important to kind of understand aspects of the demo. 
So we'll be referring to this diagram here that you guys see on your right uh, for the next few slides. So it's worth getting acquainted with this little diagram on the right. So we'll start at the center. Uh, at the center is this thing called uh, pipeline run, which is maybe the most obvious aspect of Tecton. Uh, a pipeline uh, above this pipeline run, this is things that define it, things that go into the pipeline, the, the pipeline definition, definition of tasks, which we'll get into in a second. Below the pipeline run, as you can see in the arrow that says creates, these are things that the pipeline run when it starts that it actually creates in your in your cluster. So a pipeline run, another way to explain it is it's an instance of a pipeline, again, the definition, which is above, which binds that definition to a set of defined parameters, resources, or workspaces, which are volumes. So basically inputs. It takes a pipeline, binds it to some inputs, and, make, and that represents an invocation of that pipeline. And we'll see more of this in the demo, but when a pipeline executes, it creates a task, um, and it creates those tasks according to the dependencies that are laid on the pipeline. We'll talk about that in a second. So coming back to the pipeline that I showed you guys before, which you kind of see in the corner there, um, this is a pipeline that we'll see in the demo. And you can kind of see the tasks are all the little boxes or little ovals that you kind of see there. And it takes, it takes in some parameters, which isn't obvious from the screenshot. But then those parameters get passed through and get operated on the pipeline. It also takes in something called a workspace. So you, you see the tasks are the checkout task, the set build version task, the build app task, and then it does task four and five in parallel, running unit tests and doing static analysis. Again, so it looks very similar to a, a Jenkins kind of blue ocean pipeline uh, at, on the face of it. Again, going up from the middle of the pipeline run, so a pipeline run, you define a pipeline. So a pipeline is just the canonical definition of the tasks and the order they're meant to run to operate, to integrate, to create your final artifacts, whatever that may be. Whatever you take in, the pipeline defines all the tasks and how to move through a task graph to get your outputs at the end. Um, pipelines can be reused between projects, though they're not the star of reuse. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and again, they're also there just to help reuse because they map inputs that come in for a pipeline run to kind of canonical parameters that then are mapped to the different tasks underneath. Uh, tasks, this is the layer above, you know, this, this thing above. So pipelines define tasks. And tasks, this is our first tecton seal of approval. This is a reusable, shareable unit of work to be executed. So tasks are meant to be, they take in inputs, they take, they, spit out outputs. They're like little mini one-step pipelines, if you will. And these are meant to be the things that not only can they be run independent of pipelines, but they're the things that are meant to be shared across companies. So tasks are meant to abstract away, you know, and run at another level of abstraction, this notion of what I'm trying to do, whether it's, I want to check out a Git repo, or I want to build, a, I want to execute a Maven build. These are all sort of reusable chunks that you could imagine sharing, not just within your cluster, but to the world at large. Um, tasks also define, we'll get into this in a minute, they define a list of steps that run sequentially. So there's no steps that run in parallel, it's just steps that run in the order that they're defined. Uh, and there's a reason why you don't just have one big long step, which you'll see in a second. Um, to that end of reusable, because you'll notice in this, some of you may be terrified by the amount of YAML, um, but Tecton is, there's a number of task catalogs that have sprung up around this notion of sharing tasks in Tecton land. Uh, one of the most uh, popular is this Tecton CD, the main Tecton project slash catalog. And these are a bunch of reusable tasks to do some of the things you see here on the slide, image builds, source to image, language specific builds, all this kind of stuff. And these reusable tasks, help to counter sort of the dizzying, infinite kind of flexibility uh, of the Tecton approach. So we'll take a quick look, uh, and I may have to zoom in a bit on, on my stuff to get you guys to see it well at this resolution, but we'll take a look at like a little bit of how those things are defined. Before I go any farther, any questions or anything I should be aware of before we get into this? Stephen or Amanda? Yeah, we do 
We have a question from uh, from Rob Mark. He's just asking about any thoughts on best practices mm -hmm. for sharing Tecton tasks uh, between teams. Lovely bit of alliteration there. Ah. <laughs> yes, very nice. Um, yes, um, the, some of the, uh, the principles of reuse are kind of anything that you would come up with in terms of if you're a developer with object-oriented programming and stuff like this, you should have, it should be well encapsulated, you should have well-defined parameters. Tasks wind up, you can wind up thinking of them a lot like functions. So you want to think a lot about what kind of things go into the task and what kind of things come out of the task. Um, these links, again, which you'll get after the fact um, in the presentation, it's worth looking at that catalog at repo, and you'll see some of the tasks that are there for sharing. In fact, I, I use one of them. Not only can you just use them wholesale and install them in your cluster for use in all projects, if you so desire, but you can steal some of the YAML code or borrow, because open source we borrow some of the YAML code. Uh, hopefully that answers the question a little bit. Any, anything else? Any other questions before I... Uh, no no questions, questions at this time. So, all right. So what I'm going to do here, this is a, a little something I prepared earlier. Um, so I'll try and make that go away, that little thing. So this is just a video of the Jenkins on the bottom. That's the Jenkins pipeline that was run in my cluster. And then I'll zoom in here. Let's see if I can get that to work. So what you see here is that same pipeline that you just saw before. This is the definition of that pipeline. And here you see the tasks. And I'm just expanding out the checkout task. And here's the definition of the checkout task, which you see here with all the parameters that go into the task. And then you start to see the steps uh, coming in below. You notice we have a parameter called URL and the, the pipeline is busy mapping parameters in it, that it gets to the parameters that the task expects. And then you can see the task is doing arbitrary stuff in its script inside a container. It steps our containers, which is giving away a little bit of the next section. This is set build version. This one's kind of fun, this task, because you'll notice here uh, on the right, you see the workspaces that it shares. So I checked out to a workspace, which is just the volume that all the tasks use. So they have a common scratch pad, if you will, to write to. This other fun thing is like, you notice I'm using Tecton to build Tecton. So this dog fooding container, which allows me to do kind of fun stuff like that. Again, just showing some of the versatility of the steps. We've seen a bunch of different languages being used. And then here, this is uh, another example of a generic task, maybe getting to your question, which is a generic Maven task. So it takes in a workspace, it takes in a bunch of arguments and a build directory, and all these things go into defining how I should build whatever it is that gets pushed into the pipeline. So if we go on to the next step, so that may not make a ton of sense just yet. That's okay, I just want to give you, it's hard to know how to approach it. We'll look at it from the top down in just a second. Now I mentioned, I cat, let the cat out of the bag about containers. This is the second really cool thing about Tecton is that at the heart of Tecton, much like Kubernetes, is the humble container. And so that means these steps are just containers. And so you can build, if you can do something with a container, that means you can do it within Tecton, well, within reason. Um, so if you know, basically, as you can see, an obvious step in a pipeline, which we already saw before, was the Maven build, right? Like, so you can imagine building a Java application using Maven, that's what it might look like to use that task. But as we also kind of saw with the Tecton kind of container, the dog fooding container, um, you can just run, as you see here, this very simple example where I just run a Python image and I can pass a script to that Python image, which just means that now I have infinite flexibility. If I don't like Groovy or I don't want to use that domain specific language, I can use a language I'm comfortable with. Now, there could be problems to this. And again, you see with Tecton, you got to balance your terrible, terrible freedom because there could be good reasons why you don't want arbitrary scripts just running in your steps. Uh, and I think this is some of why steps are not the shareable unit. It's meant to be tasks that are the shareable unit. Um, but again, since steps are containers, some of the things that you're used to giving to containers, like secrets, config maps, all this stuff, all those things are available to you. And there are ways to define that inside the tasks and uh, contain the steps underneath. Um, so that's task. <laughs> 
Uh, to get back to inputs for a second, remember I said that when we talked about our pipeline run, that it's binding the notion of a pipeline with inputs that you want that pipeline to act on. And that's a pipeline run, an instance of a pipeline. The three types of inputs that Tekton recognizes. One is something called this broad category called pipeline resources. So these can be inputs as well as outputs, which I kind of highlight here. Um, and it's meant to run with that notion of a pipeline supposed to take something in and spit something out at the end. So a typical input that's always given is like a Git repository. And what gets spit out at the end of a pipeline is an image, some sort of containerized kind of image. The parameters, these, you saw a little bit of that before in the, when we looked at the code a little bit, that it just adjusts how a task or a pipeline is run. So we pass it into the pipeline and the pipeline figures out how to map what I passed into it to the different tasks. Because again, the tasks have no idea what pipeline they're gonna be composed into. And then third, this notion of a workspace is pretty important. These are volumes that can be provided um, ahead of time. So the persistent volumes and you have persistent volume claims and all those Kubernetes, all that Kubernetes stuff that you guys are used to, you can specify this in a pipeline run or the, its friend, the task run to say, I want this pipeline to operate in this volume. So it's good for reuse and it's good for sharing between tasks. Now, just to highlight to you guys, in upcoming releases of Tecton, the future of the input pipeline resources is a bit in question. Um, so there, instead, the community has kind of seen that workspaces and parameters kind of suit, suit most purposes. So what happens to pipeline resources in general is a little bit in question, but that's what happens with open source, particularly new open source projects. They change quickly, so watch this space. Getting Looking at some of the things that the pipeline run creates, and we'll see this in a demo in just a second to kind of drive this home. Um, pipelines create tasks, task run. Pipelines define tasks, and I'm sorry, pipeline runs create task runs. Now, a task run is just a pod, and Again, like I talked about before, if you have a pod, that means it has access to other things on the cluster if you so allow it to, such as secrets or config maps, or you can have them run as certain service accounts. There's even advanced features like being able to have your tasks run with sidecars. Um, you know, so this is kind of the third killer feature of Tekton, which is the tasks, not only are they thing pods that you understand in a Kubernetes sense, the pipeline only spins up the pods at the time they're needed. So whereas a traditional kind of master agent kind of setup for Jenkins, where the agent is just there for the whole of the execution, for a Tekton task run, pods kind of come and go with sometimes only the workspace being the only thing that is uh, persistent between the invocations of the task, which we'll see in Can a second. Just ask a very, very quick question, Mark. So, yeah, I was just going to stop to ask the oh, question before we get into this demo. Timing. Yeah, we just had a question from Walton. Uh, he was yeah, asking yeah. Uh, whether to, uh, Tekton can use cloud build images. Is that something you're familiar with? Uh, not off the top of my head, but what I, I could try and answer that in the more kind of academic way that if you can reference the image in a pod, then likely you can run it as a step within Tekton uh, because you can provide all those things that you would to a pod as, as you can. It, so Tekton allows you to expose things to the pod the same way you'd expose things to the pod uh, normally. So if you need that container to run with privileges or you need it to run as a special service account, there are facilities for these things and new facilities are being added all the time. Remember Tekton's kind of a bit on the bleeding edge right now. Um, so my answer would be, not knowing exactly what those are, probably yes. How's that? You can take that to the bank. Maybe yes. Who knows? I'll just shrug. Say, whatever. You can't ask for a rebuttal because. So it's cause definitely yes, microphone. unless it's no. <laughs> so we have another. <laughs> Academically, it's we have yeah, another question from uh, Pankaj. He's asking, are the pods then suited to be jobs instead? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of you might be looking at this and saying, yeah, I liked it better when it was called jobs. So yeah, it is kind of tasks are kind of like jobs. And in fact, um, for those of you who may look at the Git repo, which will be linked to in this in these slides, um, the setup 
of some of the this whole demo. You run a script and it sets it up. There's a task that's used very much like a job to set up sort of an internal Git repo for the purpose of the demo. So there are a lot of similarities between tasks and jobs. The difference is the tasks are kind of run in the Tekton ecosystem. So we haven't gone deep into things like results and other things that Tekton is doing behind the scenes. One of the new things that Tekton does is when tasks share a workspace and you're running them in parallel, Tekton handles all the affinity to make sure those two pods run on the same node. If you have a volume that's like read, write once, or you have certain, that's on the version of Tekton I'm using here, but there, by operating at a slightly higher level of abstraction than a job, tasks get some, some special powers from imbued by Tekton. But yes, that's another way to think about tasks, like jobs. Jobs with benefits, I guess, so we're gonna, something like that. We've got another, another quick, quick question, other question from Ted, uh, who's asking about, um, we, we had a talk recently on uh, Argo, and he's talking about um, Argo workflows, which you saw in a previous Prezo, seem to be similar to Tekton, which is more better? I think that was my paraphrasing and not Ted's. <laughs> Yeah, it did more better. I this was I couldn't cram it into this talk, but there there's a higher level kind of question there about when we're talking about CI/CD, we can kind of glom the kind of three concepts together. Uh, one is sort of the compliancy, which you kind of see in here, like promote to staging. Is this okay to be released into production or to be advanced? There's the actual CI/CD, the grunt work of all the tool training, and then there's the environments that you deploy to. So one way to kind of even though something like Argo CD, which I believe is what you're talking about, and the GitOps kind of family, that's kind of in the realm of, wouldn't it be great to use GitOps to kind of abstract the tool chain away from the environments that the tool chain is deploying to? And that's some of the things that something like GitOps is good at. Now, if, something, if Argo brings in its own functionality for CI CD, that's kind of great, but things are starting to alight on, ooh, let's use Argo CD for the GitOps side, use Tekton, for the building, for all the reasons that I'm bringing up here. But again, Argo may have some of the, I'm not 100% familiar with all the different features of the Argo build solution. And then for compliance, you know, one guy I was talking to uh, said they've used Jira for the compliance. So Jira kind of is the master that runs everything and it, it pushes the CICD change to integrate or do whatever. And then the CICD chains kind of Really, you know, kind of check into a release repo and GitHub style, and they have no idea what environments. They just know the Git branch or repo that they're checking into. So, kind of a roundabout way to answer the question, but basically, Tekton is meant to do the CI/CD part of it. Argo tries to do maybe more the GitOps side of it, um, but I'd say Tekton is kind of custom tailored for that sweet spot in the middle, particularly on Kubernetes. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. Before I think we're we're done. probably done, done enough questions for just now. Uh, back over to you. Cool. Okay. So what I want to show here, and I'll need to, whoops, I'll need to zoom in on it. Uh, I believe it's this one. Let me just check to make sure I've got the right one. So when we last left our heroes, and it's going to be a little hard to see, that's going to have to be a little bit on purpose. What you're going to see here is I'm creating a pipeline here on the left. I'll try and zoom in a bit more. All right. So to start a pipeline, this is just to show that it's all Kubernetes behind the scene. It's a little bit weird. You kind of create a pipeline run resource, and that's how you get a pipeline going. What you see here on the right and oops, on the right and left, I'm just having trouble with the zoom, is I'm going to be watching pods that are running and pods that have succeeded as the pipeline runs. This is something called OpenShift Pipelines, which we'll talk about in a second, which just gives me a visual representation of what's going on under the covers. And you can kind of see here, my first task was check out, check out, it was running, and now it moves into completed. And now we're at set build version. Sorry, you might get dizzy as it goes back and forth. You'll see set build version had a couple steps underneath it. Those steps should come through here. You see I have my build version task, and it has a bunch of containers, and the containers are finishing at different times, and then they move over into succeeding over here, which you see there. Now we're on to build app, 
and that's mirroring what we see there. So again, I'm just trying to drive home the point that like, look at this, there are tasks behind the scenes. And anything that's getting written to standard out, as you'd expect from any good pod in Kubernetes, is getting logged and captured. Now, I can also just prove the, the point here as I'm kind of in the <laughs> video, kind of hunting and pecking my way to this. You can see it is a Kubernetes resource called Pipeline Runs, and you can use the kube control or OC, which is an equivalent of kube control. And then there's a Tecton CLI, which we'll touch on briefly, that just gives you some syntactic sugar to make it easier. This is a magic incantation that says, hey, show me all the logs of the latest pipeline run and follow them, which gives you wonderful color coding that you can see down the left here. Uh, if I dare to zoom in a little bit more, uh, maybe I shouldn't do that <laughs> while I'm doing this, but just trying to point out, hey, you got a pipeline run there and the logs that you're seeing are matching what we're seeing here. You see two things are running in parallel. So two tasks, which maps to two pods. Those are the names of the pods there. And we're waiting for them to finish and so forth. So I think for the sake of time, I might just say we get the point here. I'll just skip through some of this. So builds happen. This is one thing I change about the demo. I wouldn't build this Tomcat app. It takes quite a little, quite a while. Though it's sped up a bit because I'm using a shared workspace. So the artifacts from the Maven build, I'm not having to re-download them every time. Um, again, you can kind of see pods running in parallel. As they get completed, they move over to the right. And then we get to the end where we prompt our stage. Now, this is where I want to talk a little bit about the comparison between um, Jenkins. So here you see, hey, I had my static analysis and I also had my unit tests. Uh, Jenkins, like a virus, needs a host. So if I want to see unit tests, I basically used my Nexus repository to kind of upload the site. And I got sort of this generic Surefire report here for unit tests. This is one of the difficulties you might run into if you use Tecton. Meanwhile, down here, you see Jenkins has a wonderfully integrated unit test feature, like it already knows how to kind of take in a Surefire report and present it back to you. So mm, that's a little sucky on the Tecton side. Uh, just to show two, static analysis, how would you do that? You can kind of see here, there are kind of two, I have the different versions that were built. The one with the dash two is the one built through Jenkins and the one with the crazy GUID on the edge. That was one that's built in Tecton. You can see they're both in this demo posting into the same project in SonarCube. And I can kind of see, oh, what's the health you know, of the code based on code smells and vulnerabilities and stuff like this. Uh, which is the end of that demo. And going back to the presentation, like that's not all that Tecton does. Oh no, there are so many other things. Like, so some of you who have used Jenkins pipelines, you're like, well, what about the conditions? What if I wanna optionally run things? Yep, all these things are possible. Some of you may be wondering about, well, yeah, you say it sips away at compute resources and it's very parsimonious on the Kubernetes cluster, but how do I know that for sure? Um, there are metrics that get exposed, and with every passing release of Tecton, more metrics are exposed from the different tasks that are run and the pipelines that are run, which again kind of goes back to the job thing a little bit. The, these are Tecton will manage those and expose those metrics for you, so you can kind of tell the difference between what's coming from a, a given job versus a, a given kind of integration pipeline. Uh, there's a, and I believe, I think I've got this right, that the Tecton pipelines are going to be able to raise events themselves as they move along uh, so they can be more event driven, which is good because there's another project called Tecton Triggers, which we'll talk about in just a second. And the Tecton CLI, which you kind of see a picture of there on the right, that's like a whole bunch of command line stuff that it gives you extra functionality, sort of like how Istio Control does this for Service Mesh or uh, KN for Knative. It's, it's got its own CLI because we can't use Cube Control, we have to use some new CLI. But I want to talk a little bit before we're done, just briefly on one of the coolest parts of this uh, demo, which was uh, showing some of the flexibility of Tecton. Uh, so a sister project to Tecton that was split out, Tecton originally came out of the Knative initiative and then it became its own project. And it's since spun off a project, like a series of different sitcoms. Um, this is called Tecton Triggers. And you see here sort of the, the infrastructure or the, the concepts that are involved in a Tecton Trigger. Uh, this notion of an event listener. This is where webhooks kind of come in. Uh, you can have this notion of interceptors, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and you have this kind of 
to help ease in this reuse, you have this notion of trigger bindings and trigger templates, uh, which at a high level, just think of it as, hey, random stuff's gonna come in from the internet in a JSON payload, and I'm gonna need to map that to values that Tecton can make sense of. And then a trigger template says, hey, given those values, I wanna map when an event comes in to some action in Tecton, whether that's running a task or a pipeline, that's what the trigger template does. So I might stop for just if there are questions before I go into this, but I wanna just show you a little bit about how yeah, this We have a couple works. of questions for you. So uh, one from uh, Beiju, uh, can the tasks or pipelines themselves be versioned and pushed into Git like uh, how they do in GitLab CI. Yeah, because the, so this is where it's interesting, like it could get confusing with Argo CD kind of because the pipeline becomes the infrastructure of the Kubernetes cluster itself. You could imagine a world where you check in the pipelines and the versioning kind of comes through something like Git. Tecton itself, to my knowledge, doesn't have the notion built in, like something like a Knative would, of different revisions of a pipeline or different revisions of a task. Um, once you overwrite a pipeline, you say, this is pipeline A, and then you say, you know, cube control, apply, dash F, the same pipeline, pipeline A just gets overwritten. However, because all of it is YAML, ultimately, it can be versioned in Git, just like any other, uh, any other translation unit, any other bit of code. I hope that answers the question. Not, not sure because we don't have that kind of back and forth kind of feedback. Uh, yeah, we've got another. Yeah. Any other um, questions? Another one here from Rob. He's just asking if there's any best practices for applying changes to a pipeline. For example, if they want to drop in a container scanning solution or task into the pipeline, how how do you make changes? So there again. Uh, the best practices, you would probably share some of the best practices with just whenever you change any CICD tool chain. So if you're already doing it in something like a Jenkins, like we're talking about here, what practices do you apply before you change your CICD tool chain in the first place? Because a lot of those things apply. Like I said, uh, the pipelines themselves, when you overwrite them, they're overwritten in Kubernetes. There's no like rollback like you'd have with a deployment. Um, but in the case of scanning, like you could see how you could just edit the pipeline to add the scanning. You could also imagine a world where, you know, you try out your pipeline in an environment because the thing is these pipelines are meant to be isolated from one another. There is no central master. So you could try out that pipeline in another kind of environment, see if the pipeline itself works and then promote that into the central, the project um, or the CICD project. These are things that come up uh, a lot in AWS in terms of where do you put your pipelines versus where you have your different environments. And Kubernetes, I don't know if this gets to your question as well in terms of best practice. Generally, I've seen all the CI CD stuff being in one project, and then the service accounts for that CI CD project having the appropriate permissions into the environments that they push into, which again, that would be changed through GitOps, then it would be Argo that would have those kind of permissions. But yeah, you kind of get the idea there. Sorry, I, don't, I, could, I could talk about that for hours, but I know we're running out of time. Um, um, I've got one that's questions? going to make Steve, you feel really uncomfortable because it's going to be talking about Red Hat. <laughs> you have to talk about them at least once. Oh, great. <laughs> and I was just wondering, I mean, you know, Red Hat's um, uh -huh. OpenShift pipelines does lots of good stuff. Why? You know, what are the advantages of using um, OpenShift pipelines over uh, Tecton and the dashboard? Uh, right. So we might get some time to talk about that at the very end. One thing, if I just go back to this for a second, what Pipelines is trying to do, as you see here, is kind of give this UI kind of interface. Um, in fact, what I might do, let's just skip to that if I can. I'll get back to the demo if there's time, but I am I am mindful of people's time. Let me get to that question. Um, maybe I'll skip this for a second. Let me jump to the the bit that's relevant. Cool. So when we're talking about something like OpenShift pipelines or Tecton in general, um, we can talk a lot about Tecton versus Jenkins and all that, but that's not totally a fair comparison. Um, so there's a saying that I heard on the internet, uh, the plumbing and the porcelain. So the core of what Tecton is, is really the plumbing. 
So it is not, it's about as user friendly for somebody who's never been exposed to CI CD chains or someone who's not an expert in that area as a pipe is to an average layman. While plumbers love pipes and S bends and U bends and all these other crazy things, they're fine with that. Your average end user is a little bit like, well, I don't want to use, I not want to get water out of a pipe like that. And that's where the porcelain comes in. So this notion of the porcelain, something like Jenkins, especially Blue Ocean, that is sort of the porcelain as well as everything underneath. So Jenkins is kind of handling both for you. And other tool chains like Travis, Circle, even Team Foundation Server, these are all things that are attempt to give you a little bit more of that porcelain feel. Um, to your uncomfortable question, Stephen, uh, OpenShift pipelines, one of the things it does is it tries to add some porcelain on top of Tecton. So not only does OpenShift pipelines as a package make sure that Tecton, the version of Tecton, remember I said it's an open source project that like, ooh, it's at the cutting edge. Uh, OpenShift pipelines not only packages a version of Tecton that is compatible with OpenShift, uh, its version of Kubernetes, and it makes sure it interoperates with the version of Kubernetes. It also adds this layer on top, which is the porcelain. So what you see here in this animated GIF is somebody building, not me, somebody building a pipeline using a UI. And some of the dropdowns that you see, they're looking at tasks that are coming out of a task catalog to make it a little easier to, to move things along that you see in that dropdown there. And, um, there are other options, by the way, just lest I become too much of a chill. Let me see if I have it here. Um, what you see here, this is the Tecton dashboard. So for those of you who are using just generic Kubernetes, and proudly so, or you know, non-OpenShift, there's a dashboard that comes with Tecton. Again, if you look at my Git repo, you can see how to set up the dashboard. But it gives you a lot of the functionality, not the pipeline builder so much but it allows you to look at different task runs that happen, different pipeline runs that happened, and you can kind of dig into those pipeline runs. It's a, it's a pretty nice UI, but really read only. Um, there are better options if you want like kind of fully featured and you'd expect nothing less from our friends at CloudBees. So Jenkins X is another thing that is that makes use of Tecton, but tries to put some porcelain on top. Now, they put a ton of porcelain on top, so it would be an even fancier sink because they're more opinionated about what builds and CI CD chains should look like. Um, and to them, it looks like a world of build packs with Docker files and Jenkins files and Helm charts and things that, you know, if you, for some reason, for some good reason, probably really want to use Jenkins, Jenkins X is something worth investigating as well. Um, but why, why not just switch to Jenkins X? Um, there are a couple things you need to consider. Like it will bring its own DSL as it's being opinionated and trying to elevate the conversation. It'll bring it, you may not agree with some of those opinions. You may not like to have that. It tries to black box stuff. This is a problem just in general with CI CD tool chains because projects are all different special snowflakes. Uh, it can be hard to abstract away all the things under the covers because invariably you will wind up having to go deep to try and build some idiosyncratic part of your project. And like any kind of platform in a platform, there's going to be kind of limits to its compatibility. So you can see there are links here that the current version of Jenkins X doesn't always track what the current version of Kubernetes is, and it could be lagging by quite a bit. Um, and whether they certify these things or not, this is some of what Red Hat attempts to do is to make sure it certifies that things like this version of Tecton definitely works and OpenShift pipelines works with this version of Kubernetes. Um, so plumbing and porcelain. Now, Time check, it's seven. I can skip the last part of the demo and just wrap up here, or I could or I could just go back to the demo and then wrap up. Do we have a, a sense on how we feel? Do a poll? I don't know. I, I knew how to do this in the real please. world. I don't know how to do keep this in the real world. <laughs> there we are, I keep, keep, give it up. Don't even pause for breath. Okay. Keep going, you're not getting away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, what I what, one thing I want to highlight as I, as we were going back and forth, and I was skipping through this before we get to the last part of the demo, is you may have noticed this bit here. So there we are. I time lapsed a lot of this build, and then notice this bit up here. You may have seen a little Slack message kind of came in. How did that happen? So this is kind of one of the cool things. So we remember we were talking about events and event triggers. 
Um, one of the things that Tekton can respond to, not just GitHub, of course it can respond to GitHub and Bitbucket and all your favorite CICD uh, sort of Git sort of code repo tools. It can respond to webhooks in that way. It can respond to arbitrary webhooks. Um, and this was kind of a, a fun adventure where some of you may be familiar with the Slack API. What you saw in the previous incarnation is at the end, Tekton, again, remember, like a virus, needs a host. So it doesn't have its Jenkins master in a way of asking, hey, would you like to promote to staging? So instead, I thought, well, let's use Slack as a host. And in the Tekton catalog, I looked through the Tekton catalog, like I said, you can. And somebody already kind of had some examples of how you might post to Slack. And so once you post to Slack, then you want to be able to like actually deploy, respond to what you got posted in Slack. And that sounds like a webhook to me. Now, what you see here is just that. So this is a webhook that's responding to Slack. So you tell Slack, we won't get into that here, but you tell Slack sort of here's the URL of my webhook. So like any other good um, pod or service, you have to expose it external to your cluster. But once you do that, which Tekton makes it easier, Tekton triggers makes it easy, you then have your event listener, which is listening for web events coming in. And then the key kind of bits here are the trigger binding and the trigger template. The trigger binding, well, let's go to the template first since I have it here. The template is sort of what you want to invoke when the event comes in. And the other bit is the binding, which is sort of saying, I'm going to get stuff coming in from JSON that looks like this. So it uses sort of a JSON path type syntax, but it makes it easy to kind of map, you know, almost like a camel -y kind of thing, make it map what's coming in from an arbitrary uh, webhook or arbitrary web call into variables that abstract away where that call was coming from. And then I kind of use my trigger template here. And the thing that I was interested in coming out of Slack was this thing called what I call image label, but in Slack, it was coming to me as body.slack actions.value. So you get some, there's there's more of this in the Git repo and special call out to uh, Kevin Victor, who did this Slack interceptor, which again, open source is a wonderful thing. Uh, it did some of the heavy lifting of sort of taking what was coming in as URL encoded for, form input and turning it into JSON which is another kind of just showing the kind of almost infinite flexibility of Tekton. And just to see this bit play out at the end, you see here, I've been through everything. I've deployed to dev. I de I'm deploying to stage. That might be hard to read, but that's what's going on there. You see in the logs that I made a post to Slack at, at that endpoint. Go ahead and post to that endpoint. I dare you. I know you see it in there. Um, I can send links to Slack. And I can look at the build that was run and evaluate it. Again, I need a host. I don't have a Jenkins host in this case when I'm Tekton. Now I'd like to promote to staging. So what I can do is what I sent to Slack was this with a callback, hey, promote to staging. And it can open the pipeline run. You can see, hey, let's go to staging. And you go into that and you can see the pipeline run staging. It's now deploying that image that I built. And this is just kind of proof dev. And then if I go to the staging side, the staging version of Pet Clinic is there as well. So it's just final thoughts, and then I will take some questions. So saying that Tekton is the future of CICD, that's a bit of a broad claim. Um, however, like we were talking about in discussion about GitOps and where it fits in terms of compliance and all this other stuff, it may be an important piece of the puzzle, particularly for Kubernetes-centered environments. Um, but like I say here, ask your doctor if Tekton is right for you, it's not for everyone. And here are a couple easy uh, things that might qualify you out of even paying attention to Tekton. If your development is happening outside a Kubernetes cluster, it's hard for me to imagine a use case where you'd want to spin up a Kubernetes cluster just so that you could run Tekton. Like, Tekton doesn't have an answer for you. If you're not using Kubernetes, I would say, in my opinion, um, prove me wrong out there, but I'd say look elsewhere if you're not already in Kubernetes land. Second, 
Remember that tecton is kind of the plumbing, not the porcelain. So it's infinitely flexible, just like pipes are infinitely flexible, at least in terms of their composition. But if you're not ready to deal with the YAML or sort of some of the debugging challenges you can have with arbitrary container containers running underneath, it can be, you can die by the amount of flexibility you have. And questions we had about conventions and best practices, yeah, these are all being worked out now. Um, however, there are things out there like Jenkins X, like OpenShift Pipelines, there are other projects out there that are trying to expose this functionality through the porcelain instead of the pipes. And then finally, um, the last thing you'd want to consider is that this is still at the bleeding edge. Things do go wrong and I've run into some issues. If you look into the code in the repo, you'll see that there's a little hack where different tasks are told that they can retry a couple times. And that happens because of problems accessing a workspace that the task gets assigned to the wrong node and another, yeah, you'll see, it's not great. But if, no, if you don't even know what I'm talking about there, just remember what I said about pipeline resources, that if you start using them and you love them, they may get ripped away in a later release and you'll have to figure out how to re-implement your pipelines around workspaces. So it's kind of the risk you run in Tecton land. Uh, other than that, I think we're open for questions. Just, just to do hound Amanda and Steven for the resources from this presentation. There's a bunch of helpful links in there. Red Hat related, as well as ones that are more generic and to this uh, pertaining to this talk. If you would like to be closer to some of the Red Hat goings on or want a way to contact me that isn't LinkedIn, I invite you to join our Slack community, which we kind of post announcements ahead of time there. And uh, I've, been, I've become a bit of a concierge for people in the Red Hat. So for those of you who may use Red Hat products, this is a good way to kind of get a bit of a backbone into Red Hat land. Um, so I commend that to you. And that's it for now. So any other questions or anything else? <laughs> hate mail or other things that people want, want to, last shots, parting well, shots from, that people uh, want to take. One question from, from, from Colin, he's, he's the asking, what's the fancy multi-time zone clock thingo that Mark's got? <laughs> I love it. It used to be free, but it's not. It's something called Figure It Out. Uh, and it's a, yeah, it's an extension to Chrome and it makes your blank page be this kind of time zone. You can kind of specify a number of time zones. Now you have to pay for it. Unfortunately, you can only have three time zones. Like you said before, you referenced, I used to be a CTO of a global company. So I used to have like eight time zones of all of our different offices and figure it out. So now I don't travel as much thanks to COVID. So who cares that figure it out as a paid service, but I didn't get any promotional consideration for figure it out either. So, but hmm. you can go out there and find it yourself. I think I've worked out Thank how you, Tom, how you give such, such slick talks and I might have to borrow one of your techniques ongoing. All you do when you do the live demo thing is you get your font so small and unreadable that when you run it, you just, it doesn't matter what comes up. You can just go, yeah. As you can see, it worked again. It just kind of <laughs> And they just hands. keep talking. <laughs> Have I rumbled you? Yeah. You know, I think it's I think you've found it out. Look, if you want to be able to see it at high magnification, these links are also available in the slides. So the slides have the links to the different movies if you want to be able to see them up close and personal. <laughs> no, Sorry no, about the about uh, one small instance, I think. So the, there's been a few people asking if you'd be gracious <laughs> enough to make your slideshow available. Yes, please. This is what I'm saying. Like uh, It's meant to be shared. We're at Red Hat Land. We like to share everything. So the slides will be... Uh, They'll be in PDF form for you. All the links should work. And there'll be a link to the Git repo as well, uh, where you can pull down some examples if you want to play around with Tecton. Uh, there are, were a couple OpenShift specific things, like you know, OpenShift Pipelines runs on OpenShift. But most of what you saw in this demo, all the underlying running the pipelines, the Tecton CLI, the Tecton dashboard, all of these things can be run on Kubernetes of a advanced enough version which I think is 1.14 for this version of Tecton that I was using. Uh, I've got one other question quickie, and that is just how do you, obviously these, you know, these tools are fantastic when they're working nicely, but I'm imagining that you probably have to do some debugging occasionally. Is that like 
an environment variable thingy? Is it like you need to log shipping and some scripting foo to be able to debug it? How do you do it? Yeah. Uh, the kind of cool thing about Tekton is that you get a little bit of the benefits of Kubernetes debugging for free. So because it's all, all the tasks are logging to standard out and Kubernetes is collecting those all, if you're using something like a Kibana and Elasticsearch, like you can search for stuff that way if you're trying to figure out oh, what was going on. Things like Stern will work as well. You know, that CLI kind of dresses up some of this stuff, but you have access to that. Um, things like if I plug OpenShift, because this actually helped me in debugging something that went wrong in Tekton land, um, there's an OC debug command, which allows you to kind of recreate a pod as it was before it died. So it'll tell you like, oh, here was the environment variables passed in. Here's the command I was going to run. And you get to kind of inspect things on the pod itself and the pod just being a, rep a task that was run. So you can kind of go through the containers. You can step into a container in a pod. Um, and even if you don't have all that, the notion of being able to run tasks individually through a task run, that you can just run a task like a job, so the question from earlier, that can make it easier to kind of, as you're developing a pipeline, kind of run a task and try it out. Um, you just kind of have to get your inputs right or mocked. So you can imagine mocking a, a workspace, mocking a volume to have whatever you need in it, whether it's a clone, Git repo, or whatever. Um, so debugging kind of follows that. Higher level tools, I don't know of. You kind of then look to any other tools you use for Kubernetes debugging. Um, but yeah, I mean, surely if your Tekton task was running a container that was a Java app, if you expose the debugger in the Java app, that port, you could connect to the debugger and debug that build step in that way if you so desired. 